Okay, so hi everyone. I'm so sorry I couldn't make it in person, but I'm really excited that I get to do this virtually anyway. And a big thanks to uh, NSBP and also uh, DPS. So you already gave a, a great introduction. Um, uh, I, I'll, I'll kind of skip over this quickly um, and say that uh, I'm now based at uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. I moved out to uh, Maryland in October 2021. And, uh, and uh, I'll talk more about what I've been doing in my current role uh, as, as we go on. So I'll start right at the beginning. Uh, what is the JWST? Uh, so it's uh, the largest and most powerful telescope we've ever sent to space. Uh, it has a 6.5 meter primary mirror made of 18 separate gold plated movable segments, uh, four scientific instruments that work uh, in infrared wavelengths, uh, a tennis court sized five layer sun shield uh, to keep it cool. And all of that was stuffed into a rocket and launched into space on uh, Christmas day of 2021. And then it slowly unfolded itself as it approached its home at the L2 Lagrangian point, uh, 1.5 million kilometers away. Uh, so it's already done so much in just a year of science that it's had so far, and I'm excited to share some of it. Uh, and building it was also an international collaboration between NASA, uh, the European Space Agency, uh, including the UK where I'm from, and the Canadian Space Agency. So uh, a lot of people say that JWST is the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, but that would be a kind of disservice to Hubble, because uh, when it comes to space telescopes, Hubble is still the most famous example, although JWST is catching up slowly. Uh, Hubble launched in 1990, so it's been around a long time. It's actually um, two months older than me. Um, and in that time, it's been a lot busier than I've been. Uh, it's done over 1.5 million observations and it's produced beautiful images of the solar system, like the ones here. Um, here's some examples. The, these are examples of planetary images uh, observed from Mars all the way through to Neptune uh, and some moons as well. And the, uh, uh, the JWST's mirror has an area more than five times greater than Hubble's. Uh, and uh, Hubble and JWST really complement each other and have been working together very effectively over this year, which I'll, I'll demonstrate later. And it's more appropriate to call JWST the successor of Spitzer. So my PhD worked with the Spitzer Space Telescope and it was launched in the same generation of telescopes as Hubble in 2003. And it was decommissioned only recently in January, 2020. And it was in an earth training orbit uh, and it was pretty small uh, with mirror is uh, less than a meter across, um, but it's more similar to JWST because of its wavelength range. Um, so how is the JWST better than both of these uh, older telescopes? How have we improved? Um, so comparing them, um, the major difference is the size. And for telescopes, bigger always means better because we have a larger mirror, which means we have more photon collecting area. Uh, so we can look at dimmer and smaller and uh, colder and more distant objects. And uh, JWST's mirror, um, as I said, has, has an area of more than five times greater than Hubble's and more than 45 times greater than Spitzer's. And my favorite fact is actually that the Spitzer mirror is the same size as the secondary mirror mirror on the JWST. So um, on the diagram of JWST, the secondary mirror is the one on the end of the boom that reflects the light back into the instrument. So that's the same size as the Spitzer primary mirror. And uh, I already said the, the wavelength ranges are slightly different with all three of these observatories. Um, Hubble sees from the UV through uh, to the visible um, through into the near infrared, so about 100 uh, nanometers through to 1.8 microns. Uh, Spitzer saw from the near infrared through to the far infrared, so from 3.6 to 160 microns. And then JWST looks at uh, kind of in the middle at uh, near infrared through to the mid infrared at 0.6 to 20. 8.5 microns. Um, so uh, for planetary science, this is useful because we can see through the hazes of the atmosphere and we can see different altitudes and different features. Um, we can see features in the right of this Jupiter image um, that's in the near infrared uh, for JWST um, that are either invisible or more difficult to see in the left visible Hubble image. Um, but both images are useful for looking at different things. So they work very well together. And the JWST wavelengths also overlap 
with both the Hubble and the Spitzer. So we get like a, a little a filling of a gap. Um, and it also makes it even more relevant for us to um, compare to these two telescopes um, in answering questions brought about by the telescopes. So how does a space telescope like the JWST work? Um, uh, the main job of any telescope is to look at uh, faraway things. And JWST gathers light from these distant objects and focuses it into uh, its multiple instruments that are housed behind its mirror. And those uh, 18 segments um, that are all able to move completely independently, um, it means we can adjust the focus remotely at any time. And once that light's focused into the instruments, um, JWST stores um, that observational data before transmitting it back to Earth. Um, and we receive it via the DSN or the, the Deep Space Network. And that's a number of huge dishes locally, located around the world. And when they receive this data, they send it um, through to the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is located near here in Baltimore. Uh, and they process and store it um, and distribute it um, to scientists uh, all around the world. Um, so uh, anyone can access a lot of this data. So uh, the four main instruments aboard, they're all housed in that um, integrated science instrument module, the ISIM, um, that's that big box behind the mirror. Uh, and we have uh, the fine guidance sensor or the near infrared imager and slitless spectrograph or the FGS nearest. It's kind of um, a two in one instrument. We have uh, the near infrared camera or near cam, the near infrared spectrograph or near spec, and the mid infrared instrument, MIRI. And uh, you'll notice that um, three of these instruments operate in the near infrared, and uh, MIRI is the only one working at longer wavelengths in the mid infrared. Um, but these instruments provide imaging and spectroscopic capabilities across this whole spectral range. So um, imaging capabilities are kind of easier to understand and, and describe and kind of see what's going on. But what makes the JWST so powerful and exciting for scientists is its spe spectroscopic capabilities. So JWST has six different spectroscopic modes, um, but the main principle behind all of them is um, the usual spectroscopic um, principle. So um, splitting up light into these different wavelengths, uh, measuring how much light there is at each wavelength, and, and that gives us a, a spectrum like the one shown above. So this is a, a simulated spectrum that shows the kinds of molecules that could be detected using a spectrum in uh, the Eagle Nebula, so a star forming region. And uh, all six of these modes do uh, a similar thing, but all slightly differently and are used for observing different things. So I won't go into detail about all of them because I don't know the details about all of them, but the most exciting spectroscopic mode for solar system scientists is the IFU mode or the integrated um, or integral field unit or integrated field unit. And uh, an IFU, uh, it means a cross between imaging and spectroscopy. Um, so best of both worlds, uh, each pixel in an IFU image has a unique spectrum associated with it. So this forms something called an image cube um, because it has three dimensions of information. And we'll see how useful that is for, for planetary science in a moment. So when we think of JWST, we think of astrophysics and cosmology and these distant galaxies and the Big Bang. And um, really the JWST has these four major science themes. Um, so the first one, first light. Um, so that's looking back over the 13.5 billion years to see those first stars and galaxies forming in the early universe. And then we have um, galaxies. So helping us to understand how galaxies assemble over billions of years. Um, and then the third one we're seeing through the dust um, to look at these stars and planetary systems. So these beautiful nebula pictures that are everyone's phone backgrounds, uh, they're even my background. And um, then the fourth one, um, when we think of this last one, a lot of people immediately think exoplanets. Um, but um, there's no better way to understand how planetary systems work than by looking at our own planetary system. Uh, and solar system science with JWST is a large and very important area with around 7% of JWST's first year of observations devoted to our own solar system. 
So what can uh, the JWST look at in our solar system, what it have the ability to look at? Um, and it can observe everything from Mars out. Um, so planets, moons, asteroids, Kuiper Belt objects, comets, um, it's fair game as long as that sun shield remains um, in the correct place to protect the instruments from uh, the heat of the sun. And it's actually more difficult than it sounds. It had to be um, theorized from very early on in the telescope's um, uh, production. And um, when it's primarily looking at distant objects um, like stars and galaxies, stars being so distant means that they're relatively dim and also stationary on the night sky. And everything in the solar system in comparison is extremely bright and uh, extremely fast moving. So engineers had to overcome these obstacles to make solar system science possible. So uh, to get the observatory ready to do its job, we had to go through a process called commissioning where we get everything working, how it was designed to work. And JWST had uh, three phases that happened over six months. Um, so the first phase was the spacecraft commissioning, which mean, meant launch, uh, deployment, and um, the beginning of us cooling everything to operating temperatures. Then the second phase was the telescope commissioning, so aligning the mirrors and all the other optics so we can get clear images. Then the third phase was the scientific instrument commissioning, so making sure those four instruments were calibrated and characterized and uh, everything was working the way it should. And all of this was completed just over a year, a year ago um, in July of 2022. So that's why we're kind of celebrating um, a year of JWST science because it's a year since the commissioning ended. So this image shows all four of the instruments with their light successfully focused and ready for that third and last instrument commissioning phase to begin. And for this phase, um, I was part of a team led by astronomers at Space Telescope Science Institute, so that um, place in Baltimore, that did uh, a part of this process. And we did two things that are important for solar system observations, moving target testing or MT testing. And that made sure that JWST can track these objects moving quickly and scattered light testing to make sure the instruments don't break when they look at something bright. So for uh, MT testing, uh, to observe objects in the solar system, we need the whole observatory to change its pointing direction relative to the background guide stars during the observation. So um, we had to test this capability by observing asteroids of different apparent speeds using each instrument and instrument mode. And so these images here are uh, asteroids we observed for the testing or some of them. And our initial uh, speed limit that we had um, or the limit that we initially thought JWST could handle was 30 milli arc seconds per second, um, which is an angular speed. And you can see uh, the one in the middle is traveling over twice that limit. Um, so uh, we can still successfully track it because you can see it in that bottom left quadrant. Um, so the, the observatory is tracking it perfectly. And as a result um, of, of all this success, we are able to increase the speed limit for future observations. And I'll show a really great example of that in a minute. So the other type of testing was scattered light testing. So we wanted to answer some fundamental questions about the observatory. What happens if the telescope looks at a bright source? Can all the functions still work? Uh, will all the instruments still produce images? Uh, and we tested all of these questions and happened to get these Jupiter images. And these were the first images of a planet with JWST that we ever got, and they shocked everyone. Um, the rings of Jupiter are really not an easy thing to image, and here we did it with just an instrument test, so it was a really great sign of the planetary science to come. My boss actually showed me these images in, in the pub one night, and um, I almost cried. <laughs> So uh, my main job with JWST is to support the solar system scientists who have used JWST in the GTO program. So the GTO program is the Guaranteed Time Observation Program. And these programs are awarded to the scientists that contributed significantly to the design and management of key hardware and software components of the JWST uh, and or helped plan the observatory's scientific mission. Um, so Heidi Hamill is a scientist that was awarded the time um, that she chose to use for solar system science of all kinds. And she's now one of my supervisors. 
and uh, myself and my colleague Ian work on this. Um, so um, we're kind of on opposite sides, um, but doing the same job. So I work on everything planetary and Ian works on everything small bodies. Um, so each of these bullet points is a program that has a team or multiple teams of scientists um, from many different institutions all around the world um, who looked at their target in this first year of JWST operations. And um, I work with those scientists in getting them from the raw data all the way through to publication of their scientific findings. So Ian's area is small bodies. Um, they're of huge scientific interest because they're the leftovers from the formation of the solar system. We're using them to try and answer our biggest questions about the early solar system and planet formation. And they might even be able to tell us, uh, give us clues about the origins of life on Earth. And I'll be going through some of these examples in detail in a minute. And this is my area. We get the best pictures, of course, um, and uh, we can get a better understanding of how different types of planets and their unique systems are formed throughout the universe. We want to know about uh, planet planetary atmospheres. We want to know about clouds. We want to know about surfaces, interiors, weather, composition. We also want to look at their moons uh, and their rings and their smaller satellites and satellite systems to better understand their formation and their evolution. And we're always looking for signs of life anywhere we can, uh, especially on rocky and icy bodies. And that's where spectroscopy really um, comes in handy with these um, uh, objects. So the solar system seems uh, like quite a small place when thinking on a cosmological scale um, and uh, the distances of other galaxies, um, but it's a it's a pretty vast place to explore with a lot of diversity and uh, a lot of object, different types of objects to look at. Um, so this diagram is not to scale at all, um, and I'm going to talk in terms of AU when I talk about these distances. So one AU is equivalent to 93 million miles, um, or the average distance of the sun to the Earth. And the Kuiper Belt, um, for comparison, uh, beyond Neptune is at around 30 to 55 times that distance. Um, so now I'm going to kind of show you what the JWST has been doing this year, um, because it's been extremely busy. And I'm going to organize this mostly by distance, so starting close to Earth and going out. So we'll start with um, the closest objects to Earth, or near-Earth objects, very handily named. Um, or NEOs, um, and a, a small body is considered to be an NEO only when it's at 1.3 AU or closer. And uh, a great example is the asteroid system of Didymos and Dimorphos. Um, so Dimorphos is orbiting around the larger Didymos, and JWST wanted to observe these two rocks in particular because they were target, the target of the double asteroid redirect test, or the DART mission. And DART's aim was to check if we can alter the trajectory of an object in case something ever comes towards Earth. And uh, what DART did was it hit the smaller Dimorphos. Uh, and this image on the right is a time lapse of uh, five hours that shows the impact of DART from JWST. And this was a huge feat for us in the MTE test team because DART was traveling at 110 milli arc seconds per second, which is over three times that initial tracking speed limit. Uh, so only after that extensive testing and commissioning was this uh, observation made possible. So another important milestone uh, was uh, hit with DART, pun intended. And uh, it marked the first time that JWST and Hubble simultaneously observed the same celestial target. So the images in blue here are from Hubble. Um, the images in the back are taken at almost exactly the same time. And the one in the front here was taken 12 days after the impact. And images like this helped scientists to come to the conclusion that the mission was a success and that we did in fact alter the orbit of Dimorphos. And this marks humanity's first time purposefully changing the motion of a celestial object and the first full scale demonstration of asteroid deflection technology for planetary defense. Uh, and scientists are also very interested in the ejected material that's coming out. So the tail that you can see in that front image, um, they've been studying how it moves in space and its composition in order to better understand the inner workings of all these um, small bodies. So taking spectra of the tail to kind of see what's happening inside, because it's not very, it's not every day that we get to um, see a, a fresh collision um, in our solar system. 
So uh, out at 1.5 AU, we come to our planetary neighbor Mars, uh, and we have uh, a lot of landers and orbiters um, at Mars, but we need JWST to kind of take a step back and take a global perspective, especially at these uh, wavelengths that we don't usually get to look at. And JWST took these maps back in September last year, and this left image shows a surface reference map with two near cam instruments field of views over the top and the near infrared images from JWST are on the right. So Mars is one of the brightest objects that JWST is allowed to look at. So it really was an amazing achievement to get these images and the other um, people who were looking at Jupiter and, um, and some uh, other objects that are just as bright were very relieved to know that if we can look at Mars, we're, we're, we're gonna be okay with some of these other objects. And we also use near spec uh, to uh, do spectroscopy at Mars. Um, so this is a spectrum from one micron through to five microns, uh, almost the full near infrared capability of JWST. And the shorter um, wavelengths, so um, shorter than three microns, um, it's a little bit brighter where the spectrum is dominated by reflected sunlight. And then longer than three microns, we go further into the infrared and therefore we're looking at more thermal emission. And we can see the bumps and the dips that show that we have detected um, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and even some water. And this tells us about the dust and the icy clouds and what kind of rocks are on the planet's surface and the composition of the atmosphere. Um, so lots of information to, to get from these spectra. And asteroids are made of uh, metals and rocks where comets are mostly ice and dust um, and have that characteristic coma or tail. Um, so comets aren't usually found in the main belt because it's warm and we thought uh, water ice would kind of melt there. But main belt comet 238P read um, shows us something um, pretty unexpected. Um, so on the left is an artist illustration of what it might look like um, with all that ice and dust vaporizing because of the heat of the sun because this thing's so close to the sun. And on the right uh, is the actual JWST image and uh, the spectrum as well. And the image shows us that distinctive halo and tail that makes it a comet. And the spectrum shows us that there is water vapor present. And scientists are trying to figure out how comets like this even exist. Uh, and this also marks the first time that a gas has been confirmed at a main belt comet. So uh, Jupiter is the largest and one of the brightest and most challenging objects to observe with JWST. Um, so a team of scientists called the ERS or the Early Release Science Team have got the job of testing all of the instruments and all of the modes on Jupiter's whole system. Um, so they're testing JWST science capabilities uh, in the solar system and, and helping all of the, all of the other teams that we're, we're supervising. And that's where um, these images come from. So the team has been uh, characterizing Jupiter's cloud layers, um, the winds, the composition, the temperature structure, and even its auroral activity. And uh, it's characterized the rings and the smaller moons as well. And this is some of the ERS team's most recent work on some of Jupiter's larger moons. Um, so Ganymede, the largest Galilean moons on the left, and Io, which is most volcanically active, that's on the right. And the top images are some close-ups from the Galileo and Juno missions, and the bottom images are from JWST. Um, so that's a spectroscopic map of Ganymede uh, on the bottom left, and um, it shows the light absorption around the poles that's characteristic of the molecule hydrogen peroxide. And hydrogen peroxide is a result of charged particles around Jupiter and Ganymede impacting the ice that covers the moon. And uh, th on the right, that's an infrared image of Io um, showing several ongoing hot volcanic eruptions. Um, so that central really bright one is at um, Canahikili Fluctus. And the one on the right um, is Loki Patera. And this is the first time we were able to link volcanic eruptions to um, uh, forbidden transitions of gaseous uh, sulfur monoxide. So um, this excited form of SO. Um, and uh, these are from two separate publications that have um, very, very recently come out. So going out to 9.5 AU, we arrive at Saturn. 
Um, so this NearCam image is targeting the whole Saturn system. Um, so we can look at the rings, the smaller moons and the atmosphere. And although the um, Cassini spacecraft observed the atmosphere from closer up, this is the first time we're able to look at this particular wavelength at 3.23 microns. So um, this is unique to JWST and scientists are still trying to figure out why there's that dark feature at its pole. And um, they're also using the long exposures of this image to look at the fainter, more diffuse rings because um, Saturn is the, the king of rings. So what about Saturn's largest moon, Titan? Uh, Titan is the only moon in the solar system where there's a, a dense atmosphere and it's the only body where there are rivers, lakes, oceans like on Earth, but they're made of methane instead of water. So Titan had this amazing press release with these two left images from JWST near cam on, on the left. It shows one filter highlighting the atmosphere and the right one shows a, a composite of different filters. Um, so we can see clouds and the albedo changes on the surface and even lakes. Um, Kraken Mare is thought to be a methane sea and uh, Belette is composed of dark colored sand dunes. Um, so the, the most exciting thing for um, the scientists that at least I was um, talking to uh, is the clouds. Um, so after seeing these clouds, scientists really wanted to look again to see if they were still there or if they disappeared. So 30 hours later, they used the Keck telescope. So this right image is from that observation and shows that the clouds are still there, but they've changed in shape a bit. Um, and uh, it's always helpful to get multiple observations at different times, but it's especially helpful when a body is so dynamic and active um, like Titan um, and the other atmospheres in the solar system, because it's constantly changing. So uh, another one of Saturn's large moons is Enceladus, uh, and we put it in the same group as the Galilean moon uh, Europa as being an ocean world because um, they're cold, um, but we think they have these deep subsurface oceans that may contain life. And scientists use um, uh, JWST uh, recently, um, and they discovered this uh, giant plume jetting out of the south pole of Enceladus, and uh, extends more than 40 times the size of the moon itself. And this animation shows how the plume feeds the moon's torus, and it has been estimated that roughly only 30% of the water stays within this um, water donut around, around the planet. And the other 70% escapes to supply the rest of the Saturnian water, um, like system water. So how do we know it's water? Um, this is where the IFU uh, capability comes in. So it's a near-spec IFU and we use it to isolate the pixels that have uh, the plume. Um, so it's highlighted here in purple. So when we extract the spectra from just those pixels, we see those obvious water features. And those features are concentrated in the plume and not at the actual moon or in the background torus section. And that's how um, we now suspect a lot more water in the Saturnian system comes from these plumes and uh, leaves this giant torus around the planet. So um, uh, centaurs, uh, in irregular orbits between Jupiter and Neptune, you sometimes get these weird things. They're half comet and half asteroid, and they're named centaurs because um, the mythological centaur is a half human, half horse. I don't know who came up with that, but it's great. Um, so past Saturn, um, but before we reach our ice giants, we run into the centaur Chariclo at around 13 to 18 AU. Um, and what was so special about this one that we wanted to look at it with JWST, it was because it went through an occultation. And even though it's only 160 miles across, it has rings. Um, and an occultation is um, like how we uh, study exoplanets, very similar to that. So an object travels between us and a star and it allows us to measure the light um, from the block star to find out more about the object. And so the left video shows um, Chariclo moving across that star in the center. And the right graphic shows what happened to the star's light. And you can see how close it was. We unfortunately didn't get an actual occultation of Chariclo, but we did get an occultation of its two very distinct rings. Um, so we get um, two dips in, in that light, um, showing that it has two rings around um, this very small object, which is amazing. 
And shortly after that occultation, JWST also captured a spectrum with near spec of the whole Chara closed system. And this spectrum uh, showed the presence of crystalline water ice, which has only ever been hinted at before with ground based observations. And this is really redefining the different classes of small bodies in the solar system and, and showing us that even though things might be considered small bodies, they can still have very complex planet like features like rings and moons. So we've looked at most of these objects now, but of course, uh, my favorites are Uranus and Neptune. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on them. Um, my thesis used um, a space, um, used Spitzer to look at Uranus and Neptune, and uh, I looked at mid infrared spectra of the planets and used radiative transfer analysis and optimal estimation retrieval to try and figure out what's happening in their atmospheres. So temperatures, chemistry, circulation, vertical profiles. So I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but this was all in preparation for JWST before it launched. Um, so why did I pick Uranus and Neptune for my PhD? I could have picked any planet. It wasn't just because they were beautiful, it was because we know very little about them. And uh, in this uh, graphic here, all of the lines that you can see are um, where we've actually sent a mission. And you can see that Uranus and Neptune are extremely lonely because we've only visited them once with Voyager 2 in the late 1980s. Um, and we did a flyby of Uranus in 1986 and one of Neptune in 1989, and that's it. We haven't been back since, but hopefully that will change in the near future. So when JWST finally set sights on them, it was uh, a very, very exciting time. And Uranus is my favorite. Uh, it's out at 20 AU. And it's my favorite because it's the weirdo of the solar system. It's the only planet tilted on its side. It also appears to be much colder than it should, uh, colder than Neptune, even though Neptune's further away from the sun. And this image is a two color composite from February. And it's not actually a GTO program. These images were taken as an outreach only program. So not for science purposes, but just to showcase the capabilities of NearCam to everyone. And uh, we looked at the planet for a total of just 430 seconds. And it's amazing that we can still see rings, moons, clouds, all beautifully clearly. Um, and it's actually, it wasn't on purpose that we only looked for 430 seconds. It was actually that the observation mostly failed um, and uh, we're still waiting for a secondary observation, but we still had enough to do a press release with all of this, which is really amazing. And there's still a lot that can be done with these images. We can actually get hints of the kinds of exciting things to expect in the future. Um, if we zoom into this, we can see blurs in a lot of the places we expect to see the smaller moons. Um, and scientists are already um, starting to delve into this data a bit, a bit more to try and um, look closely at those moons. Um, and they're trying to look in detail at the rings and also trying to observe more uh, distant faint rings as well. And we see a lot of detail in the atmosphere on the right. So the cloud features tell us a lot about circulation, weather, deep chemistry, and uh, the faint polar structure that you can see uh, usually needs a lot of exposure time uh, and processing to see uh, using other telescopes. So it's amazing that we can just see it with um, this failed observation. And if we keep going out uh, to Neptune at 30 AU, so this observation did not fail. Um, this was a success. And this was the first time we pointed JWST at an ice giant. So it was the most exciting day for me uh, in the past year. So you can see Neptune with its amazing rings and its largest moon, Triton. Uh, and the planet being on the background of galaxies, you really get a sense of scale of our solar system compared to the rest of the universe. And I was a subject matter expert for this and the Uranus image um, that I just showed. And as subject matter expert, I worked with a team at Space Telescope to get it ready for public release. Um, so I helped with getting the raw data ready to send to the artists um, where they made these composites. And I also researched and um, presented to the artists and writers what was interesting and new and exciting that they could put in their press release. And remember, we're all the way out at 30 AU. So um, the time it takes for Neptune to go around the sun is 164 Earth years. Um, and it's actually so distant um, that th this fact always blows my mind 
that in the time that modern telescopes have been invented, that we've been able to actually observe Neptune, we've not seen enough time pass for us to view the North Pole. We've never seen it. We don't know what the North Pole looks like, which just is mind blowing. So that's the kind of distances we're working with. And when I first saw this image, um, I didn't even think I was looking at Neptune because we hadn't seen the rings like this um, since the 80s during the flyby with uh, Voyager 2. Um, so I thought that somebody had accidentally sent me Saturn image rather than a, a Neptune image. And uh, we've got seven of eight of the moons that are in the field of view labeled on, on the diagram. And uh, in the atmosphere, we can also see lots of features. And scientists still don't fully understand everything we're seeing because it's at wavelengths we haven't really looked at before. Um, so they're still trying to digest and figure out what's going on. And then we have Triton, um, Neptune's largest moon in that top corner. Um, and that's actually got its own program, um, completely independent of this. Um, because it's actually considered a small body because we think it's captured a captured Kuiper belt object rather than a natural moon. So it, it has a lot more attention from the small body community. Then um, some other details you may have missed um, in these. Uh, not only can we see the rings, but we can see um, these uh, faint features, which are called ring arcs in the top left there. Um, and uh, we can also see the faint inner gal ring and Nyad, um, the moon, uh, is visible and it's only 60 kilometers in diameter. So even at this short exposure at 30 AU, we're still able to see something 60 kilometers in diameter. It's really quite astounding. And the right image here, um, they, uh, the two images, they show the atmosphere at two wavelengths. And we can see the brighter areas um, are methane clouds, so reflected sunlight, and the darker areas are looking deeper at methane emission. And scientists are still kind of using these images to do science, uh, even though they were just meant for outreach. Um, there's a, a lot of um, papers, I think, trying to use these for um, their scientific outcomes. So um, these first ice giant images have all been taken with NearCam. Um, so for the uh, GTO, we kind of want to use MIRI and NearSpec more because uh, of their IFU capabilities um, and spectroscopic capabilities. And uh, the mid-infrared especially is exciting because it's so hard to observe from Earth um, because things like water vapor especially block a lot of the mid-infrared wavelengths we want to see. We only get very small windows um, to see through the atmosphere from the ground. So why is the mid-infrared useful in particular for these planets? Um, these are some example images of Uranus from visible through to the microwave. And we can also apply the same um, like uh, vertical profile to Neptune. And these different wavelengths are sensitive to different depths in the atmosphere. So on the right, this shows that vertical structure of a typical ice giant atmosphere. So we're show showing the stratosphere and the troposphere below separated by the tropopause. And we see where each of these wavelength band senses um, or where it's sensitive to um, the visible and the near infrared in purple and blue. So um, like a Hubble Space Telescope or some ground based telescopes, um, we we kind of sense mostly the cloud tops, um, the tops of these um, tropospheric hazes and uh, the microwave goes deeper into the tropical. Tropopo uh, troposphere, but uh, with the thermal or the mid-infrared, we can sense both the stratosphere and the upper troposphere, which is extremely useful. Because these depths are what we call the middle atmosphere. Um, so uh, it's the stratosphere and down to around two bars of pressure in the upper troposphere. Um, so these images um, are Uranus at two different mid-infrared bands from the Very Large Telescope or the VLT, uh, Vizier instrument. And we see a different structure of the troposphere compared to the stratosphere. Um, the stratosphere contains complex hydrocarbons that we're very interested in. Um, these uh, hydrocarbon hazes dominate stratospheric processes. Um, so when methane is elevated into the stratosphere, it's broken down in, um, into uh, component forms um, by photolysis or photodissociation from the sun and uh, reforms into complex hydrocarbons like acetylene and ethane, um, ethylene, all of these. 
Um, and observing these species tells us a lot about the chemistry and the vertical processes of the atmosphere. Um, so the mid-infrared was a main motivation for using Spitzer and JWST to look at both of the ice giants. So this is some of Spitzer spectra. So Spitzer was used to observe both ice giants between 2004 and 2007 when it was still in its cold phase. Um, and because the mirror is so tiny, uh, we can't get any images, none at all. We're treating um, both planets like point sources and uh, we just get spectra, um, globally average spectra. Um, so this is an example from 2007 equinox of Uranus and the 2005 uh, of Neptune. And we use these spectra in our um, radiator transfer and retrieval models to find out what the atmosphere is made of, what the temperature is um, at different depths, and how things change, uh, the, the chemistry, et cetera, how they change at different depths. Um, and that can even give us clues about weather and circulation and uh, deeper chemistry as well. So we used to have to kind of choose between getting information like spectra with Spitzer and images with ground-based telescopes, but with the JWST, we can get both using that IFU technology. So we can really see how that's so powerful, um, especially at these wavelengths. Um, and one of my favorite facts is that because um, each of the spectra, each of the pixels has a spectra, they're actually called spaxels, uh, which is my favorite science word at the moment. Um, so uh, for ice giants, especially getting these image cubes is extremely exciting. And I can't unfortunately show you um, some of these uh, image cubes because they're still um, on their way to publication. Um, but uh, I can show you the models that we generated of them before launch and tell you that it looks extremely similar to this. Um, like I thought I was looking at a model when I saw the actual results. Um, so uh, the first observations of Uranus actually happened were actually with MIRI and NIRSPEC in January. Um, and it allowed us to plan ahead for actual data analysis to make these models. Um, so these are generated synthetic data cubes in the resolution and the wavelength range of the MIRI IFU. Um, so the uh, image is part of a, an example data cube and then each pixel in the image is a uh, has a spectrum which is a similar resolution to the snippet that's above and the resolution is actually a lot greater than the resolution of Spitzer. The highest resolution, spectral resolution of Spitzer was 600s, um, whereas um, the, the lowest resolution of JWST is in the thousands. Um, so it's really exciting um, to get such great data. Uh, and I'm almost finished. Um, so I'm PI of some Hubble time that is looking at both ice giants at around the same time as JWST. So we're using WFC3 UVIS instrument to do similar observations to uh, the Hubble Opal or Outer Planet Atmospheres Legacy Program. And it's exciting because we get these extra wavelengths into the visible band. Um, we get uh, dark spots of both planets um, and they're only visible in blue wavelengths um, and JWST doesn't have blue wavelengths. Um, so uh, it's really exciting that we can actually see them with um, Hubble and, and kind of look at the same time and see if there are any there. Uh, also with the IFUs, we get a lot of information, but we sacrifice a little bit of detail so we can get better detail from Hubble in the near infrared to identify smaller cloud features, for example. And the OPAL program has been observing these planets with Hubble since 2014. So we also add a little bit of temporal context when we when we compare things alongside this data set. And uh, there are multiple programs that observed alongside um, JWST for Uranus, actually. Um, other H uh, Hubble observations in the UV, XMM, Newton, and Keck all got to look at the same time. So there's a really exciting data set about to, about to be released. Um, and it's seriously enhanced what JWST can do. And I didn't want to finish without mentioning Kuiper Belt objects um, because the Kuiper Belt extends um, pretty far out to 
55 AU uh, and um, these KBOs are much colder and further away than asteroids and comets. Uh, so this makes them harder to observe, um, but it also makes JWST's capabilities the most advantageous for them. Um, so a lot of JWST time was devoted to Kuiper Belt objects. And I've lost count now because over 80 different Kuiper Belt objects have been observed in cycle one. And this has allowed scientists to start classifying them in new ways and gain more information about their colors, sizes, compositions. And none of that was doable before JWST. So everything I just spoke about was in cycle one of JWST time and cycle two technically started at the beginning of July and goes until the same time next year. And a lot is planned in the solar system. Um, so uh, a lot more small bodies uh, are gonna be observed because there are so many countless numbers and Jupiter's upper atmosphere and Aurora are gonna be looked at uh, more closely. Uh, the smaller moons of Jupiter and Saturn, there's also a lot of them to look at, a lot more that we haven't uh, focused on more ocean worlds because uh, people are very excited about um, planet uh, moons like Europa and Enceladus and uh, a program where we're going to do near cam maps of Uranus uh, similar to the outreach images but uh, with more time and filters specifically for science and scientists are already writing proposals um, for cycle three um, so they have to write their plans and their justifications to use the telescope and then a science panel then decides later this year who has the best ideas and those are chosen as the next observations so it's a stressful time for science scientists right now but it's also exciting and um, look out for um, any news um, about the uh, Uranus Orbiter and Probe or UOP um, or the next flagship mission, hopefully. Um, so uh, there was a decision to send to Uranus rather than Neptune, um, purely based on technology readiness. Um, so because the distance of Neptune requires more advances and tech, um, uh, the Uranus is, is ready now. So that's why they chose Uranus over Neptune. And the optimal launch window is actually soon. It's in the early 2030s, uh, but that would mean that things start ha start having to happen like in the next couple of years, which um, may not happen. Um, so we'll see what the timeline looks like in the next few years. And um, we recently had a meeting in Pasadena to discuss the mission, and it's a great time for early career scientists and engineers to get involved. And this should start uh, being a pretty regular thing, um, these kinds of meetings. So look out for any future ones and any early career travel grants that may be available because they were for this meeting and they will be for future meetings. Um, so yeah, thank you. I will leave you with the summary and I'm happy to answer any questions.